Hello, my name is Leah and I am the Administrative Assistant here with Africa Fire Mission. I want to welcome everybody to today's training. Thank you so much for attending today. And I want to thank um, Edward Collette for also coming and presenting today. He has a really great um, presentation for everybody, so I'm really excited to hear it today. I just want to remind everybody to mute yourselves. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand, we'll call on you, or you can always type it in the chat. I'm consistently monitoring that th throughout the whole presentation. So I'll definitely see if you have any questions or anything you wanna type in the chat, I'll be looking for that. I also just wanna remind everybody that I am going to be sending out certificates today after the training. And to receive a certificate, you do have to attend 75% of the training. That usually looks um, about 45 minutes of the training if it lasts the full hour. Um, and we will also be recording this um, whole presentation and I'll be posting it on our YouTube channel later as well. That way you guys can just go back and watch it if you wanna refresh, or you can also send it to your colleagues or anyone else that might be interested in the presentation today. I just want to pass it off now to Jose. He is our fire safety advocate and he has a little bit of a word of encouragement for you guys. Thank you, Leah. And uh, thank you, uh, Sir Edward Collette for finding time to come through here. Also, uh, just to remind us before I start with the word of encouragement, uh, it is important that you put the right name uh, on, the, on, the, on the Zoom because the name that you put on the Zoom is actually what will appear on your certificate if you are, if you, uh, are successful with the 70%. So that said, um, I, I jump right into the word of encouragement. Um, I'm just reminded uh, the story in the Bible uh, about the uh, miracle of Jesus uh, with healing the paralytic at Capernaum. You can find this story in the book of uh, Ma Ma Matthew chapter 9 from verse 1 to 8. I'll not read it through, but um, the, the main story is that uh, there are these uh, two friends, or is it four friends, who <clears throat> couldn't get access uh, uh, to take this uh, uh, paraly uh, paralyzed friend of theirs or a paralyzed man to Jesus to heal him. So they got to think very quick and they took him to the roof and they lowered him down uh, to Jesus, the man down to Jesus. And of course, Jesus got to uh, heal him and he walked, he walked out. The main reason why I felt this is relevant to us is that... Um, the people who we surround ourselves with are the same people who need to be the uh, people to uh, either give us uh, help and uh, even take us to where the help is at. And it's the same thing even in the firehouse. The people who are in the firehouse need to be so close to you so that when you get to the fire scene, they can get to be creative and use the tools that they have to either free the people in the car or even uh, use the tools to free the people who are trapped in the house, and even use the uh, tools creatively to, to get the job done. So I would encourage us to be the friend who will offer help to the other person who's in the firehouse or around us in the home. So stay encouraged and uh, let's jump right in to today's topic. Uh, back to you, Leah and give us the next step. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. And thank you for also um, reminding about the Zoom names. So if you don't know how to do that, if you take your mouse and just hover over your name, um, an option should come up that you can change your name from there. Um, if you don't know how to do that, please just feel free. You can chat me well, or um, I, you can email me as well. And well, I'll make sure that we get the right name on your certificate because I know that is so important. So if you can't figure that out, no worries. We can help you with it. Um, but now I just want to pass it off to Ed Collette. He has a great presentation for everybody today on extrication with power tools. Ed is having some connectivity issues today. Um, and so are you muted, Ed?
I can see you on one screen, but you might be muted on your phone. There, I'm sorry, I was muted. There, no, you're can fine. you hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, so, okay, thanks. I'm glad everyone could show up today for this training on extrication using power tools. I know um, Howard last week went over using hand tools. So we're gonna kind of do, use this as a jumping off point to looking at vehicle extrication using power tools. There will be some things that we'll be talking about that he probably also went over as far as scene setup and also um, how some of our activities we do at the scene. But that repeating is a good thing because those actual items are kind of very um, important to our safety as well as the safety of the patients that we are trying to assist um, in these vehicle accidents. What we're gonna be looking at today in class is we'll look at the big part is planning and training and knowing our tools that we have to work with. <clears throat> and that lets us be more efficient and effective as we go to these incidents and able to help the, the community that we serve and also keep ourselves and our fellow firefighters safe while we're doing um, this extrication work. The biggest thing to always remember is we're taking the car away from the patient, not pulling the patient out of the car. Um, only in extreme circumstances do we want to pull the patient out of the car. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're pulling the car away from the patient so that we can easily extract them from the car without having to um, overly jostle them or potentially cause other injuries by how we're removing them. The whole thing is training's critical. Even if we don't have cars available, we need to actually cut up. We need to be going out and looking at how cars are put together, how they're built, potentially what we would do to take them apart if we had to, given the tools on hand. Train with the tools. Um, know the direction they operate with the different control switches. Be very adept at using the tools in different positions with body mechanics uh, to lessen the chance of injuries to ourselves. Uh, look at how you place the tools. Study the tools, how they work with the vehicles, look at different vehicle features, uh, look in the community, look, look at what type of vehicles you have in your community and most often that you would see on the, on the road. Uh, see, understand what type of, um, understand what type you have for as far as um, going through the roadways and how the type of speed and how that may influence the crashes you may have. Um, be prepared to know your job when you get on scene. Um, make sure you have um, pre-designation writing assignments like we do. Uh, we will have uh, our board every day to know that who's the officer, uh, who's driving, and that person will be in charge of logistics when we get to the accident scene. We have a firefighter designated to do the spreaders, the cutters or saws, and stabilization. And then that person would also be in charge of any type of fire suppression duties that we would have. So last week we talked about hand tools. So this week we're gonna be looking at power tools. So they can be of various ranges from saws, sawzalls, circular saws, band saws, drills, impact wrenches, anything that we can run off electricity or battery power. Uh, today we use a lot of battery powered tools. We can do a lot of work just with several tools, just with a sawzall and an impact wrench we can be able to take apart probably about 80% of the car at an accident scene. Now, it'll be slower than we use our heavy hydraulic tools, but this is always an option that we have available to us. We have air tools, which are our air chisels, impact wrenches, and airbags, uh, good for lifting, good for cutting, uh, some of the light metal features to get access to other features of the car. 
along with the impact wrench, which we don't really use the air impact wrench anymore. We've moved to battery operated air uh, battery impact wrenches. And then we have what we call our light hydraulic tools, which consists of porta powers, and which, you know, porta power is simply a manual uh, hydraulic system that has different heads that you can put on the end so that they can be used to spread. <clears throat> we can use to lift cars up off of, you know, different ob objects off of people, other victims or cars off of the victims. And then we have what we call our heavy hydraulic tools. This would be our spreaders, our cutters, rams and combi tools. These are kind of, at least in our fire service, this is kind of the um, foundation and backbone of all of our extrication work. It allows us to do a lot of heavy work very quickly and relatively easily. But again, it all comes down to training, no matter what type of tool you have. If you don't know how to use the best tool, you will get very little work out of it. If you're very skilled at the most basic tool, you can get a large amount of work out of just a basic tool if you're very skilled at it and trained in it. Oops, wrong direction. And one part of becoming skilled and knowledgeable with your tools is knowing the vehicles you're going to be working on. Part of that comes from the types as far as like if it's a unibody, which is about 90% of the cars on the road today. And then there's also what we call a body on frame. These will be your trucks, your larger SUVs, where the body work actually sets on a frame compared to the unibody where the frame is integral to the body itself. So knowing those two different constructions also improves your ability to use your tools efficiently and effectively. Some of the key parts we wanna look at, uh, the A post here, that's pretty much where a lot of the strength of the car is. It basically becomes the front roll hoop of the car that goes all the way down, that the doors bolt on to this A post as it comes all the way down. The dash supports bolt onto the, <clears throat> excuse me, bolt onto this as long as well as the firewall. The A post is a very strong, very important structure in the car. And that's one of the places that we're actually going to do a lot of our work as far as attacking to weaken it when we're trying to lift sections of the car off of our patients. Next comes the B post. That is where the door, the front door will latch to the B post and the rear door is hinged to the C post. This is another strong, this creates the mid roll hoop of the car. So this is very strong. Often this is the, one of the more difficult uh, areas of the car to cut, meaning we have to get a little creative with where we actually do our cuts. Sometimes instead of cutting the post itself, we have to cut it away from the roof line, cut into the roof line. Um, down at the bottom, we may have to cut into the rocker area more to get into a little weaker uh, material to be able to remove that to get to our patients. Then our seat pillar, usually this is the weakest, one of the weaker of the th three pillars normally because there's less um, uh, less potential as far as we're protecting front occupants here. A lot of times there's not as many uh, passengers in the rear. This, at least in the US by our structural standards does not have to be as strong as the front. This is a very easy post to cut compared to the other two. So knowing this, we would be able to cut this first if we needed to, and then spend a little more time on the front post to cut those. Then we have our rocker panel, which is our base support for the car, and then the roof. As we said, talked earlier, the doors connect to the B post. 
as far as what we call the nadir pin. This is the latch, and often this is the part where we're going to have to defeat to be able to open the door after our accident occurs. In the rear, we have the same thing, but it may be located a little higher. Looking at the actual construction of the door, it's a usually kind of tubular or metal frame that the skin, the door skin is put over. This is an important construction note when using your tools. Using heavy hydraulic tools, it's possible to peel the door skin away from this structure. Once that occurs, we really have difficulty making any progress into opening a door. When we're using lighter tools like our power tools, say our Sawzall and our impact wrenches, if we wanna to get to cut the door away from that, we know we can just cut this light skin. We need to cut the light skin to get into the heavier structure that houses this door latch so that we can cut the side of the door to release the door latch and swing the door, swing the door open. And these are just some shots to show you, especially this is, these are, this is the B post, this is a B post to see the amount of metal and the heavy construction that is in those posts. This is an A post. That's what makes these difficult to cut and get through in our operations. Then glass is kind of one of the easier places if we have to go through a windshield to get to somebody or take out a side window. Two types of glass we have tempered glass, which is the type of glass that will just shatter when you hit it with a sharp point, like either a punch or the horn of your halogen. And laminated glass, which is basically glass that's sandwiched between two layers of plastic. That is more difficult to remove. We often need to use a saw or some type of other cutting device, either a uh, specialized window cutter or an ax that can even be used to remove this. One thing when you're cutting glass, we want to put on some type of dust mask or some type of respiratory protection. It creates a lot of fine glass dust that we don't want to be breathing in. Because we're doing that for us, we also want to put some type of dust mask on our patient if we're going ahead and having to cut through any glass. The safety glass will just shatter and then drop in. One thing that we usually end up doing when we train is we'll break the tempered glass and it'll shatter and we just push it in. Well, we push it in in our trainings because we don't want to clean it up. It's easier if it's in the car when we're done and the car gets hauled off. But we want to remember when we're actually working with an actual accident when the glass shatters, we want to pull the glass out away from the patient. Uh, we don't want to be pushing it in on it. Just think about it. If you're the patient sitting there in the car and all of a sudden someone dumps a bunch of glass in your lap, that's not very good as far as safety and also just confidence level from your patient. Always be aware of where your airbags are. We don't want to put ourselves near the airbags just for the simple reason is if they do go off, um, if they do go off, it is a very powerful uh, discharge, either of an explosive charge or of a highly uh, high pressure compressed air, which will has a potential to injure us. And if we're between the patient and the airbag, potentially then the patient as we get thrown back into the patient. These are just some areas where we have a they can be all over the car. You know, the side curtains are big ones and seat airbags along with your front airbags. And this used to be a thing that we only saw then we thought about for high-end cars. This, some of the most economical cars on the market today have as many airbags as the most luxury vehicle on the road. So don't just assume because it's a cheap car that there are no airbags. They put the cylinders to power the side curtains in the A post, in the B post, and even the C post. So we want to make sure we take off all our plastic trim and make sure we're not cutting into these. This will um, 
cause severe injury to the firefighters or the patients should we accidentally cut into one of these cylinders. So we wanna make sure we take off all the plastic and then mark where those are on the outside so that the firefighter who is cutting either with a cutting tool or a sawzall uh, doesn't cut into that. So this is very critical as far as safety in our operations goes to make sure we peel back all the plastic and look for these high pressure cylinders. See, this should, there's really not a lot of audio on this, so I'll play this since you're not getting the audio, but you can see it. This is just um, the discharge of several airbags that we did in a training to see just the force of the airbags coming open and why we want to make sure we stay out of the zone of where they can deploy. This is an, one of the reasons that we go ahead and we want to disconnect any batteries of the car as kind of our first, uh, first operation when we start securing and stabilizing the car. And this will be a seed airbag. Here's another angle on the side curtain. So you can actually see when that deployed that the seat moved quite a bit um, without a patient in it. So we wanna make sure that we're outside any of those zones again. And it's very important for our safety and everyone's safety. So when we get a call, for, so we when we get a call for an accident, um, we need to start assessing that accident from the minute we get dispatched to it, and we know locate to know the location, time of day. That um, that puts in you know we know the location. Is it going to be hard to get to? Time of day. Is there more traffic? Um, the weather is going to be an issue as far as visibility. Is it raining? Um, what other issues is that going to cause with our accident scene? And also any issues that would maybe hamper our extrication work, uh, the number of vehicles and the number of victims. These, will co these come in all the time when it gets dispatched, but often we show up, we find out that there's either more, more cars involved, more victims than we originally had. So we have to be prepared to manage um, additional victims, additional cars compared to what we were just uh, dispatched for. The biggest thing we want when we're pulling up to the accident is we wanna provide a safe area for us to work in as anything in the fire service, if we get injured or hurt while performing our duties, we cause another in, we cause another emergency that takes away resources from the primary emergency we went to, and it slows the care that we can give to those patients of uh, the car accident. So we wanna create a safe work zone for us to work in. Normally this will be using our fire apparatus to block traffic, and we always try to block an extra lane than what the accident had occurred in. So if it's in 
one lane, we try to block two lanes if possible. Sometimes that's not possible because there's only a two lane road and you need some passage. Um, it's just always very important to watch the traffic and not get hit. I mean, right now in the US, we kill as many firefighters at the scene of traffic accidents almost as we do in actual fires. So the roadways are a very dangerous place to operate. We want to make sure we are always very attentive. If we have the capability to have dedicated person as a spotter, we want to do that so that they can watch traffic and help control traffic and let us know what's happening. This is a layout of how we want, if we have the capability to block traffic with traffic cones and be able to close down the lanes and feed everything over to one side, this is the layout of how we want to do that give drivers enough warning that there's an accident scene coming and they need to move over so they keep us safe and also don't cause another accident once we've established a scene that's safe for us to work within we want to do just like any type of house fire or any other incidents, we wanna do a 360 to identify any hazards, be it fuel on the ground, wires on the ground, dangerous cargoes that can be in lorries that, that may become involved in an accident. Uh, different fluids on the ground, be it oil, transmission fluid, antifreeze, these are all issues that could impact our safety as well as the working of the extrication that we're doing to get the patient out. And then we want to look for the number of victims we have in each vehicle and the severity of every each victim. You know, is it a simple, I'm just stuck and I can't open my doors, which, you know, at that point, our level is put pulled down a little bit and we can like do a little more time to think about things versus we have a critical patient that we need to get out as rapidly as possible. So that kicks us into high gear as far as thinking about, quickly thinking about how's the best way to open up this vehicle to get this person out. PPE, you know, we wanna wear our fire gear, we wanna have safety glasses, leather gloves. A lot of people will use their turnout gloves, but leather gloves often give you they give you better dexterity and feel. Uh, also, if they get damaged, they're less expensive to replace than fire gloves. And we wanna have some type of high visibility vest so the traffic can see us and helmet for head protection. Now we'll look at some of the tactics. We've you know, arrived the scene, we've made ourselves a nice safe zone to work in. We have our PPE, we've assessed the number of victims, we know we need to open the cars. What are some of the tactics we can use with power tools to open up the cars? You know, and some of your deciding factors are the resources you're gonna have, like what type of tools, heavy hydraulics, light hydraulics, or just power tools? How the vehicles are oriented. Are they on, is it on the wheels, on the roof, on the side? Number of victims, severity, and level of entrapment. These will all play into the tactics that you're going to use. Sometimes you can just go up to the door and open both handles. That's another trick. Before you, we always like just forcing entry into a house. We want to try the door before we actually try to force it open. So if you can go up to the car door, try one handle. If it doesn't open, reach inside and open the pack open the interior door handle and the exterior at the same time. And sometimes both those motions is enough that it'll jar the mechanism that you can open the door. Uh, I've had that work on several occasions for me. Um, and then, you know, just lay out a plan and start executing. You no, know, first thing is we wanna access this, if we have to do rapid access, front windows, rear windows, uh, if it's a bad patient, any safe route of access and extrication is okay. You know, level of consciousness, degree of entrapment, these are all going to dictate our actions that we take. And one, one important thing sometimes you want to do is, if it's a conscious patient, 
ask them how many people should be with them. Many times in another queue is if the windshield's missing or is there a large hole in the windshield, Maybe there's a patient that's not in the car that's got ejected. And now instead of an extrication, now you have to go find this other patient to go treat them. Or maybe they got ejected and they're under another vehicle. Now you have to extricate them from under another vehicle. So know how many patients you have. Ask to make sure you know how many patients you have. Look for cues uh, like child seats in the car. That's a big level of suspicions. If there's a child seat and there's no child in it, Make sure you ask, you know, did you have your child with you? That's always kind of one of them moments where you just think, God, I hope there wasn't a child in here because there's not one now. So hopefully they weren't with them. Um, so those are all things that are going to influence your actions on the accident scene. No matter what we do, we always want to stabilize the, stabilize the vehicle. This is for patient safety, and also the ability for us to work effectively. The way our tools are, we need to go to have a path to the ground for them to work properly. And if we don't have some type of stabilization with cribbing, be it wood, or if you can find rocks or anything else you can put under the car so it doesn't bounce up and down on the suspension while we're working, that that it that needs to be done. It also gives us, if, especially if we're using heavy hydraulic tools, it gives a path to ground for our tools to work against. So cribbing, we want to go under the pillars, like the A pillar directly under that, uh, the C pillar, how it comes down around the car. We want to put our cribbing directly under those. Those are the strong points of the car we're going to be working on. We can use step chocks if those are available. And really anything that's a solid, that's solid, then we can put between the ground and the vehicle to take up that space so it's not moving on the suspension. I know last year at the symposium, we were doing a class that we, when we did the class, we actually were using just um, rocks that we were finding around the vehicle to show that we could we don't need necessarily need all the fancy cribbing that you can find solid objects that's around that you can make fit under the vehicle just to take up the space between the suspension and and the ground of the car. So when we're looking at taking things like opening the door and door removal, always remember that the car has already been damaged. It's already been weakened. When we push in one direction, there's going to be a reaction in the door. Like if we look at this one, we can see here how the door's kind of already caved in. So when we put the tool here and start to open the door, this area here, we need to be careful. It'll start to move in on our patient. So we wanna make sure we do tactics that minimize that movement. This firefighter chose to start here right into the door latch. That'll start to move in there. Another option would be start up a little higher and where it's still a little more structural integrity and that may not move it in as much on our patients. So just examine the car, use what the car, one of the big things is use what the car gives you as far as being able to have a purchase point so before we start with anything, we're gonna remove the glass and the windows. We can do this by just lowering the window. You know, everyone's into, we, well, we always have to break the glass. I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll just like roll down the window till it's in the door. That way, if it does break, it's all contained in the door itself. We try to keep our patients covered when we, before we break glass so it doesn't get on them. So th those are kind of things to think about. You know, how can we do this the cleanest way? So a lot of times I'll just roll the windows down, maybe leave a little area that I can punch it to shatter it down in the door, or sometimes just leave it alone once it's rolled all the way into the door. So we need a purchase point to be able to get our spreaders in there or any other tool that we're trying to use. Uh, well, I can use, give, the first thing is do what the vehicle gives you. 
oh, it's been in a wreck. There's already some damage that we can use. You know, like in this car, you have gaps here between the door and the body and here in the door and the body. How you try to use those first before I'll try prying because the least amount of force that I need to apply to the car is best for the patient. So there, there's going to be no jostling. You know, there will be less jostling in the cars. So that, that will be a less likelihood of increasing their injuries. So you can use any type of pry tool, a halogen, just to give you a little space to get into the car. Just to interrupt real quick, Ed, we do have a question in the chat here. Okay. Um, Adelino asks, who determines access for a patient to be, to be removed out of? That will depend a lot on your SOGs, I mean, and your training. Like for us, you know, some places the officer will always say, this is, you know, this is what we're doing. This is how we're patient, accessing the patient, everything, you know, everything like that. And it all goes to the officers. We know our positions and uh, a lot of times also we'll show up, there'll already be a medic with uh, the patient. Sometimes the patient, the medic will just say, I need the door off. Or we can tell by pulling up what level, you know, we'll be maybe one step ahead of our officer in getting ready to say that we need to take the whole side of the car off. You know, while the officer has kind of the final say, there's a lot of interaction that they'll, the officer will ask, well, we need to do this. What is the best way you think we should do it? And I mean, and a lot of it will be, what do we think our time frame is? If it's something that we know we have a little time to work with, as far as the patient's not that critical, we will discuss a little more and make more maybe team decisions. If it's a very critical patient, most of the times the medical say this has to go off and then that the officer will agree and it's like one decision and it executes. Um, but, but a lot of that just has a lot to do with the team dynamic, um, what your standard operating procedures are, and also what the current situation is. So all of those go into play on who determines the method to extract the patient. And awesome. I hope that answered, hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you. So let's see. So when we're working, and this kind of goes, even though I says it's for the heavy hydraulic, it's kind of works for everything. So with the door removal, we want to work with the heavy hydraulics. We want to work from the nader pin and that's the, our door latch. Uh, we want to work towards that and we're basically putting our spreaders in and spreading a weight trying to swing the door open uh, forcing that nader pin and as soon as any of the metal starts to rip or tear then we need to stop and keep moving down until you know we get to solid metal again and as soon as something starts to stop or rip rip we need to stop. And if we get it exposed enough, this is kind of where the whole team dynamic comes into play. If I'm running the spreaders and I get to the point where I, I keep ripping the door, if I have enough of that latch exposed, I can step back. And the minute I step back, the person with the cutter steps right in and cuts it. So we already know just by training and working through things a lot together, that as soon as I move away, they know they need to step in and do the next action. And then if they step back, if the door isn't open, then I know I need to step back in and make give them a little more room with the spreaders. So it, it's a it's a very orchestrated um, event between the two. Then once you get the nader pin exposed and it pulled forward you're going to have to take the door off either by cutting, spreading the hinges off. And here we normally just cut the hinges. That is our standard tactic because we're able to control the energy release of the door coming off easier than we can if we just spread them. And this is a good picture too. 
I like to show, if you look right here, you can see the two bolts exposed. If I had removed the fender and all I had was an impact wrench or even sockets or wrenches, once I expose that fender, I can manually just take the bolts out of the hinges. Now, granted, it takes a little extra time compared to just cutting them or spreading them, but you know, it is a very good option and it can be done very quickly if you're prepared with your tools to go in there and just undo those bolts to take those front hinges off. So if you have light tools and just power tools, basically the first thing I'm gonna do, it's kind of works a little backwards. You're gonna remove the fender either with a sawzall or you can even use an impact wrench to take the bolts out of the fenders to pull the fender out of the way. And then maybe cut a little bit of the door lip off with a sawzall and then you have the bolts exposed. You can go ahead and just unbolt those either with uh, sockets, wrenches, or an impact wrench. So that'll free up this part of the door and it kind of can push backwards. And then once you get to the back, you can use a sawzall to kind of start cutting away the door skin. And then once you see where that latch mechanism is, once you peel the door skin back with a sawzall, then you can take and cut through the side of the door that that latch is bolted into to remove that latch from the door. And then the door should be able to swing open or then just be removed since it's already been taken off the hinges at the front. If you have air tools, it's very similar to heavy hydraulics. You can cut, uh, remove the door skin and then cut the nader pin and the latch with your air chisel. And then use a bit, you can cut through the hinges or again, just remove the, remove the fender, expose your bolts, and then you use an impact wrench to remove the bolts to, hit, to take off the uh, front hinges of take, when removing the door. A lot of times we do full side removals, and this is pretty much a tactic that um, to do as one piece, like we often do it, it requires heavy hydraulics. You can do it with light power tools in a more step-by-step -step basis that takes out individual parts as opposed to take removing this entire side off of the vehicle at once. So the first thing you do is you remove the rear door and you can do that by using your heavy hydraulics or using your light power tools with those tactics that you practice. And then you're gonna cut the B post up high. You know, usually you're gonna use a sawzall or some type of cutters to do that. And then once you're done there, you're going to try to get a little room. If you have spreaders, you're gonna spread the door to get room in to go in with the cutters to make a cut or if you have a sawzall you're going to and then finally what you basically at that point you've made one big door out of the back door and the front door once you've been able to remove that e-post and once that's all swung forward and then you're going to take the front door off either by removing the hinges, by cutting on or unbolting them. And then that gives you this whole side access for the patient. We use this tactic quite often. As you can see, the B post would been here where we removed it. And the seat is usually either right at the B post or slightly behind the B post. That's one of the design features they have for uh, safety to keep the kind of the driver's head and the passenger's head within that roll hoop of the B post, meaning if we don't get rid of the B post, we're going to have to be maneuvering the patient out around it. That's why we have started just removing the B post as a common extrication when it's when we have a injured patient that can't get out on their own. To cut in one more time, I just have another question here in the chat. Um, okay. Adelino asks, in a process when there are no sharp edge protection, what can be used in addition as a sharp edge protection? Um, a lot of times 
we'll use for sharp end protection, which will be most on all most of our cut surfaces like the A post or the B post in down low. Uh, you can use uh, salvage tarps. That's one that we use. We keep salvage tarps on the truck for we use them in fires, but we can also use them in this application. While it's not great, you can also use blankets if you have nothing else. Uh, when it comes down to it, if you don't have any really good edge protection, blankets work better than nothing. Then the other thing is be aware of the sharp edges and just try to avoid them. That's another thing that we can, you know, just the uh, awareness isn't one way to protect against sharp edge protection. But salvage blankets and salvage tarps are pretty much primarily what we use. Thank you. And the big thing when we talk about if we're in a severe enough crash where we're going to have to pick the dash off of somebody, uh, we need to weaken the structure of the car. So there's a lot of cutting involved before we would actually do something like lifting the dash off of someone. So if you can see with the green lines, those are all cut lines that we would end up making prior to using our cutters or our rams to actually pick the dash off of someone. You can see these are just pictures of us making the relief cuts and the big things, especially when you get up here in this front area, we want to make sure we do double cuts so the cut doesn't bind. You want to make sure there's a gap. That's why when we do the B, the A post up here, we'll always do two cuts in the A post. So it doesn't bind as we're lifting the dash. There's room for uh, clearance room between the two pieces of metal that we just cut. One critical aspect to doing a dash lift after we've weakened the structure substantially by cutting in front of the fire, between the firewall and the struts, cutting the A post and cutting around into the firewall is we want to make sure we put our spreaders in to take advantage of having a good solid base and the fact that, you know, the spreaders don't go straight up and down. They go at an arc. So we want to make sure we set in and get a good um, bite in with our spreaders that we don't have it. If, you know, if we set the bottom flat, then we're going to be pushing in and up. We want to make sure we set in so that they're spreading out, the arc is going to go up and out on both the top and the bottom. And don't get, make sure you don't get hung up with little things. You know, this is, this picture here on the left is a big, you know, we have really good dash spread, but look what hung up. Here's part of the wire harness. That's just taking a basic cable cutter and cutting that. A lot of things we do, like when we do B post removals, we get hung up because we forgot to cut a seat belt. Remember, it's the little things that will hold you up at the end of the day more so than the big things. Because we see the big things where we almost get tunnel vision towards the big, you know, maneuvers that we're doing and the tactics that we use. And we forget about the little things like a little bit of a wiring harness or a seat belt. And if we take, you know, a couple extra seconds to you know, cut that wiring harness, cut that seat belt, take the fender off. And that's kind of, I'll say from our standpoint was where we've been lax is we, we leave a lot of things that can cover up our work area, like leaving fenders. I'll take a couple extra seconds to remove those things that give you view and access to what you really are going to be working on. Sometimes we get in too big of a hurry in doing these jobs and then it, you know, it ends up taking us longer to do. Basically a dash roll, instead of using the spreaders to lift the dash up, we're gonna use a ram to roll it forwards. Basically the same type of cuts, except we make our cut on the A post a little farther down to the bottom. That way, that way we're pretty much kind of just hinging forward instead of lifting up. And this is what that maneuver looks like. We have our lower cut. Down here, we've made it a little lower and we're actually rolling the dash forward instead of picking it straight up. 
an issue with this maneuver, you need to make sure you have cribbing or something to take up this gap. It's necessary to remove the ram to get access to the patient. Th that is the biggest drawback that the ram restricts your access to your patient then. And that, that we went over some basic maneuvers that can be used with you know, the power tools uh, last year, and you can look up on some of the previous trainings. Last year I did, the extrication was a three-part series. We looked at the basic stuff like we just did now about a vehicle resting on its wheels, but we also looked at vehicles resting on its side and vehicles resting on the roof. So, with that, I'd like to open the floor if there's any questions or comments or anything else you'd like to discuss. We have a question here in the chat um, by Peter. It says, is there a kind of assessment that should be done to choose mode of detachment just to ensure minimal destruction on the structure in any case? the owner might intend to repair the vehicle. Could there be a case where officers are sued on account of wrecking the vehicle even more? Well, on that case in the, in the US, no, that doesn't come into play because if you're in a condition where you're a patient and we need to extricate you from the car, you know, think of as firefighters, what are we sworn to protect? Life and then property and then mitigate any of the emergencies. Life trumps property every time. You know? And honestly, especially if you're using heavy hydraulic tools, in the US, the minute, the minute a heavy hydraulic tool touches a car, the insurance companies here total it. There is no way to repair it once you start working on it with heavy hydraulic tools. You know? and, and you just have to think at the end of the day, what's more important, getting the patient out or worrying about, are they gonna fix their car? I mean, that that's kind of, that's our mind thought here in the US. It's like, you know, and I realize other places with legal systems and so, well, but we're one of the most litigious societies on earth here in the US. But I mean, it comes down to, you know, save life versus preserve property in that case. I mean, we, we have never run into that concept because Normally, if we're having to extricate a patient, the car's not in a repairable, not in a repairable condition. Thank you. And then Cyrus, you have your hand raised if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hello. Hello, sir. Are you getting me? Hi, Cyrus. Yes. I can hear you. Okay, I have a question. Uh, how do we rate the patient who is trapped in terms of a degree? Um, degree as far, well, a lot of it's going to be from a medical standpoint. I mean, we're fortunate that we have a medic unit run with our rescue company so that we'll always have a full, fully staffed medic unit with three medics on it at every accident. But you can, you know, the biggest assessment is, are they conscious or are they not? If they're unconscious. Actions compared to what you might do otherwise. If they're still, if they're conscious and talking to you, then you can slow down and take a little more time to determine what you're going to be doing. If they're talking to you and conscious and they have severe lacerations and massive blood loss, that's going to be another time. Well, you know, we're going to get moving and do things more rapidly. So a lot of it is what is the medical condition that your patient's in, you know? Conscious, unconscious, massive trauma that's visible, potential look at the mechanism of injury, you know, how badly damages the car. Because if the car is severely damaged, 
there's a good possibility that your patient is also severely damaged and you may not be able to see it and it may be all internal injuries. Does that answer your question? I think that was good. And then I also saw that Adelina, you had your hand raised a little bit ago. Did you still have a question that you wanted um, to ask? Can you use the tell? Can you hear me? Education because you were brilliant. Yep, we can okay. hear you. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Ed, uh, Ed Colette, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Regardless. I'm good. I'm good. I just wanted to add an addition of the question of uh, vehicle salvaging. I think it, it can never be salvaged. It goes according to the extent of the accident that we go through. But the moment the airbag goes off, it is written off. So there's no way that we can, as a firefighter, we can cut the vehicle in order to salvage the vehicle for, for it to be repaired again. That's why I had to add that. And thank you for answering my question on the, on the chat. Thank you for adding that, Adelino. Um, Jeffrey, you're unmuted. Did you want to also ask a question? Ed. Hi, Colin. Oh. Hi. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Eh? Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask is it a mandatory to your side, a firefighter must be an EMT? Because what you've shown us today is a very uh, a crucial. Uh, uh, um, training, yeah? and uh, if you are not a, I mean, a, a medic, you can't handle the casualty while you're still in that vehicles. So you must know how 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 to be a medic, how how to I mean how to be an EMT, so that you can handle that patient. But if you are just a firefighter, you'll just go yeah, there and the medic. vehicle, but you can't. But I think you know. Well, you, you know, you do raise a good point. And the one thing that we need, you know, we end up being uh, firefighters and EMTs is what uh, our, our fire service is. Uh, most of us, most people are fire service medics. Uh, but you bring up, we need as firefighters at least a basic knowledge of first aid that we can be able to assess uh, the patient and how badly their condition is. This is also a reason that we also must work with the EMS side of the public service. You need to work with your EMS organizations, work with them how to bring together how we can best serve our communities in these situations. So it's not just all fire department or all EMS, it's fire department and EMS working together to be able to make some of these decisions and to deliver the service to the um, casualties that we have. Awesome, thank you so much, Ed. And um, I do see that we have another question, another hand raised, but I am gonna ask just for you to hold that until we get to tea time just for a little bit um, because our, Hour is up, so I just wanna wrap things up really quick. And I do invite you to stay for tea time if you have the time. If you don't, we totally understand and you are more than welcome to sign off whenever, whenever you need to leave. But I just wanna thank everyone for coming today. Thank you for being such active participants. Um, clearly there are a lot of questions and we really got the ball rolling with the discussion today. So thank you for such a wonderful presentation, Ed. Thank you for just coming back. It's always such a pleasure um, when you present with us. I just want to remind everybody that I will be sending out certificates today. And then once again, that this is recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. I also invite everyone to come back next week um, 
and join through the same registration link that you did this week. And you are more than welcome to always share that link with other people that you feel might be interested in this, whether it's others in the fire service or just people in your community that wanna learn about fire safety as well. They are more than welcome. I will not be here next week, but Howard Cohen will be stepping in for me and he'll be doing such an amazing job. So I will miss you all dearly next week and I'll be back the week following. And I am also going to be sending out a little evaluation for everyone to fill out at the end of this meeting as well. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna pass it off to Jose for tea time. Bye-bye.